I remember my attorney sending me the complaint. And at the end of it, it said up to 10 years in prison. And that blew my mind. What's up, everyone? You're listening to the Do Hard Things podcast by Elite SRS. The purpose of this show is to share stories of hardship and victory as an encouragement for those in the middle of their own hard thing. Because we know hardship produces perseverance, which produces character, which ultimately produces hope. Today's guest is Ben Bruss. Ben is the executive director of Mayhem Mission, an organization whose sole purpose is to give back to those in need locally or around the world, working within the CrossFit community. Ben discusses his felony indictment after working at a nonprofit and the mental, spiritual, and emotional battle he waged. Ultimately, his hope was anchored in the gospel and the work of Christ on the cross to persevere. If you enjoy the show, please don't forget to subscribe and leave a review so more people can be encouraged by the stories we share. Now here's the conversation with Ben Bruss. All right, we've got Ben Bruss. Some people will know your name, but a lot of people might not. I, instead of introducing you, like to let you do the introduction. So when people ask you what you do, how do you answer that question? So I would say technically I'm self-employed. Uh, I have three primary responsibilities job-wise that I invest my time in right now. One of them is I'm the COO of a paint recycling company in Southern California. Uh, the other one is I manage our local CrossFit here in Glendora, interestingly named CrossFit Glendora. Oh, yeah. Right on brand. Yes, sir. I'm also the director of Mayhem Mission. So I've been doing that since April. I've been uh, managing our gym for about six years and doing the COO of the paint shop for about four and a half years. So very well, at least the paint shop one is a variety based role compared to the, the CrossFit stuff that you're doing. So that one was four years ago, but were you doing something similar to that prior to it that was kind of related or is that just totally a random thing? Not really, not really. It was a, a connection that was made through a friend is how I ended up in, in the paint recycling. Okay. I was working with businesses in an economic development role through LA County prior to that and was working a little bit with this company. And it just, it slowly evolved. I was starting off by working with the owner and his leadership team and then ended up getting more of a, a committed role there. Yeah. So when you think about your time, is it split 33, 33, 33, or do one of those three things get more of your time? Yeah. I spend most of my time physically in the paint business. And then the other two, I can do a lot of things remotely, you know, with the gym, as well as Mayhem Mission. But I, I do spend a decent amount of time physically at the gym. And then uh, Mayhem Mission, really the only physical presence that I have is, is things that I travel to. So I do a decent amount of traveling for that. And the rest is done doing things like this, Zoom calls, email, yeah. that sort of thing. So, yeah. You look back, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, would you have thought these were the things you'd be doing? 10 or 15 years ago, a hundred percent. No, <laughs> no, I don't think any of these would be on the radar. If you would have said something was ministry related, then I would have said, Oh yeah, I, I can see that makes sense. Yeah. But uh, specifically, you know, with CrossFit mayhem doing mayhem mission and have it being a missions based concept uh, that probably wouldn't have been on the radar. Yeah. So we, you know, when we first met, you told me a little bit more of your story, like you, you spend most of your time pursuing ministry, correct? Are you talking about early on with sort of education and that sort of thing? Yeah, and and going to seminary and mm -hmm. and 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 having that kind of bent in your career trajectory, so to speak. Right. I came out of undergrad. I went to Michigan State. I was an art education major. I could have gone the education route and instead decided to go to Fuller Seminary. Yeah. in in Pasadena. And it was just more of a tugging on my heart. It wasn't necessarily a clear call to ministry. Like I met, you know, some people who were definitely there getting their master's of divinity, going straight into ministry. Other people might've been going to missions or that sort of thing. I was more open. And I actually met a lot of people there who were kind of in a similar uh, situation heading into seminary where they were open to 
possibly a role in ministry or something, but also just kind of seeing where God would lead through their time there. And that's kind of where I was. Yeah. So when you think back on that time and this almost like just scratching the itch of curiosity, you know, to use more common language of that decision to go to seminary, are you glad that you did it? Would you advise people to kind of scratch the itch or to follow that prompting without necessarily that strong call? Because I think a lot of people get hung up on, well, I either have to be all in or not. And this is like the trajectory of my life as I look forward. And it sounds like you were somehow able to not fall into that paralyzing trap, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But what would you like when you look back and you're talking to younger people in that situation say? I would say seek the Lord on, on that decision. And, you know, everyone's different. I would say if you're, if you're going to commit to that decision, don't necessarily commit to an outcome, but commit to a decision and trust the process. You know, if if you're going to, if you're going to make that decision, trust that, Hey, no matter what comes out of this, I'm going to trust that God's going to work it for good, that there's going to be a good result that you can end up in a great spot, even if it's not directly related to whatever degree you had there. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I think if you're committed to just being open and trusting that the process is going to work itself out, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I would encourage people to do that. Yeah. Do you have tips and tricks on keeping yourself in the process versus like going all the way to the outcome? That's a good question. I think career-wise, oftentimes, especially in, uh, in, the, in the Christian world, it's really easy to get caught up into, you know, you're in ministry or, or you're not in ministry, right? You're, yeah. you're in ministry or you're in the world, in the marketplace. Uh, I've always looked at whatever position I'm in job wise, I consider that a ministry and I, I treat it that way. The people you're surrounded by, the relationships you're building, um, the work itself that you're doing, you know, scripture talks about working as if you're working for the Lord and not for men. If, if you look at uh, your job, your career in that way, I think anything can be a powerful ministry. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, okay, what, what's my purpose along the way and reminding yourself often of that purpose, or maybe even reorienting yourself back to that purpose at times allows you to stay in the process rather than the outcome. Absolutely. Yeah. I I heard once too, don't look at your, career or your job as your calling, look at it as an assignment. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that for me was really freeing and, uh, and helped kind of reinforce that concept as well about purpose. Why was that? Why was that freeing for you? Cause you think about those two words, calling sounds more free than assignment. Like assignment sounds like a burden almost right? Uh-huh. When you think about our language, but why okay. did that do that? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So I think the way I was looking at career, and I think some people might struggle with this as well. Uh, is, is it's just kind of who you are, like your identity can get really wrapped up in that, right? Like Mm. it becomes so important to you, what you do that it can become burdensome in terms of making that choice. Or maybe if you're not content in your job, you're feeling like, Oh, it kind of takes over your whole life. I I think when you look at it as an assignment, it's like, well, this is not my identity. This is not going to be the next 30 years, or this doesn't define who I am. It's just an assignment. Uh, there's going to be another assignment later and maybe another one after that. Mm -hmm. Uh, that, that to me was free. It was a season versus a lifetime kind of change that, yeah, you're right. Like I've told my brother this and I, it's like, okay, you're making this decision and it can change later. And it's like, Oh, this isn't forever. Exactly. That does. Yeah. That is super freeing. That's a good way to think about those two words. So tell the listeners a little bit about how you got involved with Mayhem Mission, because I think, you know, in the world that we're talking about there, it's CrossFit. Mayhem is kind of the pinnacle of CrossFit. And I would imagine there are many, many people who are like envious of your, the ability to be part of that world. But even more so, there's, you know, there's a group of people that are like, wow, you get to lead the most meaningful part of it in a way. And I, I just love for you to kind of share the story of how you got involved and even why you chose to say yes. to to lead that. Yeah. Good questions. So a little history, Rich Froning senior. So Rich's dad is my wife's first cousin. 
Okay. So, so technically we're family with the Fronings, known them for a long time. I remember going to Thanksgiving gatherings, things like that, uh, long before Rich was involved in CrossFit and, and hanging out with the Fronings. And, you know, they, they were family. They were living in Tennessee. We were in Michigan, but we would still see them periodically. And that background, you know, we were living in California in 2010 when Rich first competed at the games in Carson. So it was only like 40 minutes from our house. Yeah. We got wind that, that Rich was competing in this thing called CrossFit. I'd never heard of CrossFit before, but we went and checked it out. It was a, you know, a cool environment. I really, uh, the, the stuff that they were doing for the competition looked pretty cool. Yeah. And it was like, wow, this CrossFit thing looks kind of cool. Rich did really well. Actually, uh, his first year was 2010. We went and saw him in 2011. So we saw him win for the first time of, of his four years in a row. And, uh, and that just made it a little more special. And then shortly after that, we heard that Rich was kind of growing in his faith and got baptized. Hmm. So it was around that time that he had gotten baptized. I can't remember if it was before or after the games at that point, but we were excited. You know, we were you know, firmly established in our faith and we're excited for Rich. We kind of started reaching out and being in contact a little more. You know, he came out again in 2012 and, you know, we just started developing more of a closer relationship with, with Rich and Hillary. And then as the years went by, my son started getting really interested in CrossFit and we made more frequent trips to Tennessee. Uh, when they came out for the games, we would hang out. And so that relationship just got stronger and stronger. My son ended up competing at the games in the teenage division in 2019. And he was able to spend like three weeks uh, in the barn with Rich and crew training prior to the games. And uh, Josh Bridges was out there at the time. It's kind of my, my son's training buddy and stuff. Oh, so, cool. yeah, he, he had some uh, pretty good training leading up to the games. So through all that, the relationship just with the Fronies and with Rich was, was stronger and stronger. And around that time that my son competed in the games, both my son and I got on an online Bible study with Rich and a bunch of guys from Tennessee. Through all of that, you know, just got to a point where I actually had heard about Mayhem Mission. Right when it was getting started, I thought, oh, man, it'd be kind of cool to be able to get involved in that somehow yeah. and maybe even work in that. Logistically, being in Southern California and then getting started in Tennessee, I thought, it just really doesn't make sense. Rich and Brian Nelson reached out and they said, you know, hey, are you are you interested in taking this over? Now, I know Brian was kind of overseeing things temporarily and he was pretty eager to get someone in there because he had a <laughs> lot on his table yeah. and was ready for someone to, to kind of take over. and. I wasn't initially all in. It wasn't as if, oh yeah, this is a slam dunk. I love both, you know, the world of CrossFit as well as being able to be part of that ministry wise. Uh, in a way, it sounded like a dream come true, but I had a lot of stuff on my, my wife and I had four kids, a couple of them going off to college, uh, already working, you know, two different jobs and trying to balance all that. Plus the fact that Rich was family, right? And a lot of people yeah. say, hey, don't mix business with family, right? And so I was like, oh man, we have such a great relationship right now. I would hate for something to go south for whatever reason and kind of tarnish that, right? So I had some hesitations and I was very open with them about that. They kind of put those fears at ease and we talked through it. And I spent about a couple months, you know, really praying through it, just considering it. And I can get into the, the confidence I had to kind of move into that a little bit later, but decided that, yeah, you know what? The timing of everything, uh, and I can get into the timing as well, but the timing of it, just the sense I had in my heart after all the prayer and, and consideration, it was like, you know what, I can see things aligning. I'm seeing the green lights. So I'm going to step into this. So that was that was in April. Yeah. What is that? Six months ago? Correct. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Mm -hmm. Wow. I wanted to ask you just one more question kind of about you because you've had such a variety of experiences and pursuits and you currently do, you know, you mentioned you have four kids, you've lived in Michigan and California. If you look back on your life to this point, and maybe it's not fair to only limit it to three, but I'm going to force you. Uh, what three words would you use to describe your life? Or do you think best would describe your life so far? One of the first words that comes to mind is challenge. You know, part of that goes back to the title of your podcast, Dan, you know, the Do Hard Things podcast. Sometimes those hard things or those challenges find us and sometimes we kind of chase them. Yeah. And totally. I feel like 
a lot of my life, especially my adult life, has been kind of a combination of that. I think challenge is one word that comes to mind. I would say faithful in terms of, first of all, I mean, God's faithfulness to us through yeah. a lot of those challenges. Mm. It's been very evident. And I think in, at the end of the day, if you're in a, in a healthy place, uh, relationally, with your family, spiritually, even financially, there's been a lot of struggles, but we're on our feet. Yeah. Uh, you know, those are some of the things we face challenges with. And, and God has been extremely faithful through all of those seasons and challenges. Yeah. So that's one that comes to mind. Another one I would say is faith. We've made a lot of decisions based on faith and yeah. not by sight. And, and, you know, I've seen a lot of people make decisions, and this isn't a criticism at all. In fact, it's something that I think I could probably do a better job with. It's making decisions based on, uh, you know, logic, reason, numbers, that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, obviously in the business world, that's where I'm making a lot of decisions, you know, with the owners of the companies I'm working with and that sort of thing. But in terms of our life and our, some of the bigger decisions we've made, we've really made them on faith. Yeah. So, so I would mm. say that that's another word that comes to mind. How closely tied are the challenges that result and making decisions on faith are like in parallel or are they, you know, like this leads to that? Yeah, I would, I would kind of say parallel. The, the challenges that we've kind of sought out have been mainly decisions based on faith, right? Yeah, totally. And yeah, I'm going to transition us into this kind of pivotal question. And we've talked about this individually. I, I talk about this on every podcast, but the, the question that we ask is what's the hardest thing in your life you wouldn't take back? And the whole purpose of this podcast is that people would be able to share their difficult seasons and how they grew from them so that people in the midst of a season right now can hear that it ends, they can get some perspective and that they can have some hope that there's value in this and it can shift because it's so hard to get out of our valleys when, you know, we're in them. That's all we see around us. But when we can have some light shine in from other people's stories, then that does a world of wonders. So that's the goal. And that's why we've got you on here to share your story. So uh, I'm going to ask it and let's, let's just see where we go. Uh, But Ben, when you look back on your life, what's the hardest thing in your life that you wouldn't take back? If you enjoy the podcast, please do us a favor and head to your favorite podcast platform and leave us a review. It helps a ton. And there's a reason all the podcasts you listen to ask you to do this. We want to continue to encourage people in the middle of their difficult seasons and your ratings help boost our podcast visibility and the stories of our guests. Did you pause it and leave a review? If so, thank you. All right, all right. Back to our conversation. That is a great question. Can I give a little background before I get into the actual experience? Of course. Yeah, so I've already shared a little bit. I don't know if if I was destined to live in California, but that's what it feels like sometimes. Uh, I, I I was born and raised in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and then spent my first year of college there at Calvin College. I believe it's the your rival, Dan. Uh, yep, near and dear, kind of. Hope Oak College Calvin. for me. Yep. Yeah. So I spent my first year of college there close to home and then really started growing in my faith. I mean, I was raised in a, in a Christian home, going to church. Uh, my parents were divorced in high school. That was a very hard thing I experienced. Mm. Uh, kind of rocked my world and my faith a little bit, but uh, really started growing uh, my freshman year of college, you know, after kind of dealing with the pain of my parents' divorce in some destructive ways, really, really wanted to get on track, just started growing in my faith. And I had a friend who really encouraged me to become a camp counselor. He had done it. He, he thought it would be a, a great fit. And I wanted to go out west. I wanted to just kind of get out of my environment that I grew up in. And I was looking at places in Colorado, Montana. And then there was a fair at Calvin with a lot of different booths. And I remember looking at these photos of one of them and thinking, man, that looks really cool. And it was in Santa Cruz, California. You know, I had long hair, earrings at the time. Fit the vibe, man. (laughs) I I credit the people who interviewed me for, for, you know, giving me a shot and thinking that I would be a good fit to counsel kids for a summer at their camp. The interview went well. 
went out there and literally I didn't know a soul. Hmm. So it kind of made a leap of faith there, but had an incredible experience. It's called Mount Hermon. Yeah. Santa, just uh, right around the area of Santa Cruz, California and stayed out there for a year and just worked afterward. Got kind of homesick, really felt like I wanted to go back to school. And I had met a lot of counselors who were going to big schools, you know, UCLA, University of Washington, Nebraska, all these places. And they were having a great experience. I thought, you know what, I want to, I'm going to go to a big school like that. So I'd grown up a big Michigan State fan. For some reason, I didn't really feel the need to shop around a whole lot. I just applied, was accepted, and said, that's where I'm going. Yeah. I went to Michigan State, roomed with my brother uh, my, my first year there, and met my wife that year. We lived on the same floor in our dorm. Man, we had just a, a really great experience four years at, at Michigan State. After that, I had already mentioned I could have gone into art education, decided to go to Fuller Seminary, just really felt that tug which was in Pasadena. So now this is the second time I'm moving to California. Yeah. And a uh, really good experience there, both education wise and in, in the job I was doing, working with at-risk youth in a local organization there in Pasadena. My wife and I had our first child and got pregnant with our second. When I graduated, we decided we'd go home back to Michigan where she had family, I had family, we had friends from college and support network and all that. Yeah. So we really liked it out there, but decided to go back to Michigan. After five and a half years there, man, I just had the itch to move back. To, every year it got big, stronger and stronger. Yeah. You know, and I mean, part of it could have been weather-based and that kind of stuff. I do, I do struggle with the seasonal depression and that sort of thing. But it was more than that. You know, we had friends out there that we had met starting a church and, you know, just different things going on where it was like, you know what, I, I just really felt a strong pull to see if we can make it work out there. And, you know, there was financial obstacles. I mean, we had three kids by that time and cost of living was really high. I was just working a nonprofit job with at risk youth in Lansing. It's, it's not like I had a very financially, you know, prosperous job that I could just jump into or something. My wife was a nurse. She had a nursing degree, so she could work. I could work. We could try to make it work. And then finally got to a point we said, all right, we're going to give it six months, really put it to prayer. And if it works out and the doors open up, we're going to move if not, we'll drop it forever. I was starting to drive my wife crazy by this point. <laughs> so, so literally within a month, everything worked out. Green lights, mm. housing, jobs, everything. Boom. So so we made the move. And Dan, that was 13 and a half years ago. And here we are still in Glendora. Yeah. So the reason I give that background is just because I wanted to, to kind of lay the groundwork for, for this hard thing and, and sort of my struggles with some of the ways I've responded to hard things uh, prior to that. Okay. Yeah, sure. So the first five years that I was in California for the last time, I was at a nonprofit that was working with adults in the workforce industry. And I had been doing something similar with youth in Lansing, Michigan. And now I was going to be working just same industry, different population you know, different yeah. in California. After... A couple of years, I started off as a supervisor, then I became a manager at this organization. We would have routine audits from LA County. So the funds that we received were federal funds. They got funneled through LA County. We would come in and do audits and make sure we were doing things correctly. Very routine. The organization had been around for over 30 years and had a well-established reputation of doing a good job and being reputable and everything. And I was excited to jump in there. Uh, my jobs in, in Lansing had been kind of piecemeal, you know, I'll be working for a year under a grant and then have to find something else to do and then jump back into another grant. And it was just a lot of instability. Yeah. And I even had to get a paper route as a, as a grown man <laughs> having to deliver newspapers. You're probably really good at it though. Well, I, I actually challenged myself. It was kind of fun. You know, I made a game out of it to see how fast I could get all the papers delivered and set, yeah. new, set new PRs and everything. Oh, of course. Uh, CrossFit in your Yeah, exactly. It, it was not easy though, man, when it was February and two degrees and snow. And I remember getting towed out of people's driveways, getting stuck in my Pontiac Grand Am at five in the morning. Uh, uh, that That's a whole other story, man. I actually wrote, I, I wrote a book about it and everything. A literal book. Yeah. Yeah. It's called the Paperboy's Guide to Greatness. I kind of wanted to document, you know, that experience and how it led to instrumental in our, our eventual move to California. So, yeah. So, so the, the stability of, of that initial job in California was, was great. 
you know, yeah. it was a stable job, well-established organization. And then after about five years, we had sort of a deeper dive audit into one of these programs we were running. We, we operated a lot of programs for a lot of different populations. Well, this was one specific one. And uh, LA County didn't like what they saw. They, they thought that we were doing things incorrectly and even intentionally incorrectly. There's a lot of sequence of events and paperwork involved in these programs. And you have to abide by these certain rules and parameters and, and processes. And they didn't think we were following the rules. So our organization got shut down. So everybody wow. had to go get a different job. And then the district attorney got involved and they said, we, we want a deeper investigation into this. So yeah, everybody from our organization moved on. I moved on to a different job, the one with the economic development, like I mentioned. And after a couple of years, I thought, man, you know, once in a while we would have reunions and things like that. And people say, oh, I wonder what happened with that investigation. But I guess no news is good news, right? I mean, two years go by, nothing's happened. Well, two and a half years went by. And I was interviewed along with several of my coworkers by the district attorney. They were still doing their investigation. There was mounds of paperwork we were going through. You know, we were initially, initially interviewed. And then I got a call about six months later again, and things just didn't sound right at that point. Like it didn't sound good. I felt the need to call an attorney and a couple other staff members I know had gotten attorneys and things like that. And after all of that investigation interviews, everything else, they decided that there was criminal activity. If you're not following the processes. Those are crimes, federal crimes, felonies. Yeah. So like I said, I was a manager in the department that these programs are being run. So myself and two people above me were included on this complaint and were, were given felony charges. Here I am in the middle of my life, raising kids, working at a nonprofit, you know, trying to, <laughs> trying to just do my best to do my job. And here are these felony charges. I remember my attorney sending me the complaint. And at the end of it, it said up to 10 years in prison. And that blew my mind. Yeah. So, you know, I, obviously I never intended to do anything wrong going into that job. Didn't think we were doing anything out of bounds or anything like that, but through this investigation, they decided that's what they were going to charge. Yeah. And my attorney said, all right. He said, two things I remember. He said, number one, you're going to be in shock. Let this sink in for a few days. We'll reconnect next week or whatever. Number two, it's going to be a marathon, not a sprint. Don't think this is going to be gone or going away next month. It's going to last several months, probably at least a couple of years. So we're, we're going to do this one day at a time. Don't expect you're just going to be able to fix it overnight. Over those next couple of months, depression, anxiety, all that, as you can imagine, started really setting in. And the reason I brought up the California stuff is because one thing that I have struggled with when things get hard is regret. I don't, it's kind of the thorn in my flesh. It's just my natural reaction. Like, man, I shouldn't have made that earlier decision. Uh, I, I shouldn't have gone that direction. Look, look what it's resulted in. When I was delivering newspapers from Toad at five in the morning, I would think, man, why did I go to seminary? I should have just gotten into education. <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be here right now. You know, all these things. And so that was my initial reaction was, man, look what happened. Moving my family across the country. Because I was the one who kind of pushed that. Obviously, my wife and I were aligned in that decision. But I was kind of the, the leader in, in that decision. And I felt like, man, both my wife and I come from broken homes. We're very committed to our family. And I'm thinking the one thing that I would never, ever want to do to my family, it's, this is my fault. I'm yeah. responsible. I push this. Look what it's resulted in. And that just compounded the anxiety and depression that was already there. I remember just looking forward to my head hitting the pillow every night and dreading waking up every morning, just facing this reality, right? Thinking, mm -hmm. I, I finally got to a point where I was like, you know what? I'm probably going to end up in prison. I just don't know how long. Yeah. You know, and, and kind of coming to grips with that. Well, uh, there was one kind of pivotal moment where I was introduced to our men's pastor at our church and uh, he wanted to meet for coffee. So we met for coffee. And by this time, man, I'm, I'm breaking down like four or five times a day, thinking about being separated from my kids, struggling with this regret, sense of failure. And he met with me. He was very clear and said, hey, we don't know what the outcome is, but these are God's promises. He walked me through some scripture and we prayed together. He shared a little bit about his 
history with some depression he had struggled with earlier in his life, medication therapy he got and how he got better um, along with, with God's healing and things like that. And honestly, at that point, Hearing him say that, I was like, sign me up, man. I need something because I, I couldn't focus at work. I was breaking down. Like I said, depression, man. I was I was ready for some help. Yeah. And and interestingly, the next morning, I woke up and it was like I had a sense of peace and hope. I didn't dread waking up every morning. It was honestly, I have to say, it was somewhat supernatural. I, yeah. Yeah something that people would normally need, you know, medication to kind of kick in. It just happened. And so I attribute that to, you know, my meeting with, with his name is Dane Johnson and hit the prayer. And I, you know, I had a large support network who was praying. I'm sure it wasn't just that instance, but you know, a lot of prayers, everything are being lifted up and God just, boom, he just lifted this, this spirit of depression. And I just felt free. So even though things weren't resolved, I was at least able to function. I stopped breaking yeah. down, could focus at my work. And in over the next several months and couple of years, I finally got to a point where I was accepting of the situation and said, you know what? Even if I end up in prison, I trust and believe that A, God's going to take care of my family. That was a huge concern, right? Mm -hmm. B, he has a purpose in all of this. Who knows? Maybe there's somebody in prison that needs to hear the gospel. <laughs> and yeah, I need to be that instrument. I had to come to, to terms with maybe there's a purpose here that I'm just not aware of yet. And that's okay. It's part of God's plan and everything's going to be all right. You know, and I think even taking it to another level, which I'm not sure if I fully got to, even if I never understand it completely, God still has a purpose here. Even if it's not something I can look back on and say, oh, there's the redemption in this. We still have to trust that God has a purpose. So it was just a, a blessing to be able to be at that point. Yeah. You know, things hadn't been resolved over the next couple of years. You know, there were, there were court visits. I had to comb through a lot of evidence, work through my, my attorney. Interestingly, I had a, a major spiritual revelation at the end of all this. Right. So, so the biggest thing I walked away with, Dan, is... You know, initially, my stance was very defensive in my role in all this. After going through all this evidence, being interviewed by the DA a few more times, just going through everything and, and hearing, seeing other people's testimonials, I realized, you know what? I might not be as innocent as I think, because even though I didn't intend to set out to do anything wrong, I could have been more aware of the, the rules and the boundaries around some of these programs and the way this was being handled by our organization. So as a manager, I'm responsible for that. So there's something called criminal negligence. This you know, could have been a case of that, right? Where I was just negligent. I, and it was my responsibility to know the rules better. And so I, at the end of the day, I was like, maybe I'm not as innocent as I, as I think, right? Yeah. And I had this revelation that gosh i think spiritually that's kind of where i've been for a really long time like mm. lord i'm doing all the right things right in terms of uh, being a christian now i'm not saying that i'm sinless or anything like that i fully recognize that i'm a sinner before god and need jesus christ and his atonement uh through his crucifixion on the cross for forgiveness of sin and justification before god but subconsciously i think i was living my life, attempting to do all the right things spiritually, thinking that that was justifying me before God. Yeah. Right. Almost leading that into like a spiritual pride. You know, when you look around and, oh, well, again, not outwardly, but maybe subconsciously like, Hey, I'm, I'm doing pretty good, you know? And through all of this, I don't know, spiritually it's sunk in that that mentality is so antithetical to the gospel. I didn't really understand the gospel, Dan. You know, I've been walking with Jesus for 25 years, and I really didn't fully grasp the essence of the gospel and the message. Yeah. And so it finally struck me. You know, when Paul, for years I struggled with when, when Paul says, I am the I am the worst of sinners. Yeah. That's how he saw himself. I struggled with it a little bit, but I, really? Here's the author of most of the New Testament, yeah, right. planting churches, 
suffering for the gospel, giving everything. And he's going to say he's the worst of sinners. And yet now I, I get it. Right? It's like, no, he, he knows himself. He knows his heart. And, and for myself, man, it was pretty amazing recognizing that nothing that I do is ever going to justify me before God. Yeah. It's all what Jesus did on the cross, period. Period. Yeah. So I finally fully realized that through this experience, right? Right. And I was able to say, I think I'm the worst of sinners. <laughs> you know, I you know I know Paul said that, but I'm pretty sure it's me. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Paul. Move on. Yeah. Over. Yeah. And that I had never felt that way before. Hmm. So to recognize that was extremely freeing. And I see how through this, as hard as this experience was, even if that's the only thing I walk away with, it was worth it. Yeah, it was worth it. And there are other things that I definitely walk away with too. But that was really the big thing that I will always go back to and say, I finally understood the gospel. Yeah. Wow. Lots of freedom. So it was five years into California, you've been there 13. So I'm doing the math in my head. Eight years ago, that business, the nonprofit got shut down. And then Correct. two years later, or two and a half years later that you're interviewed. So we're like five and a half years ago. So when did it all kind of resolve? Is it still in process? Like where it's, how did it's it pretty much uh, it, it's pretty much wrapped up now. Okay. So it, it did last probably three, three and a half years total between the start of all the investigation and interviews and all that until things were resolved, at least on my end. And fortunately, the sentencing was a lesser sentence than the felonies I was charged with. And the consequences were much less as well. So extremely blessed to be able to have walked away. You know, at the end, I feel like uh, we definitely had had victory. And uh, even at the sentencing, this happened uh, in February of this year was was actual sentencing. Uh, My attorney was very excited about the outcome and just extremely blessed to be where I'm at and to not have to go to prison. Uh, Like I feared, you know, yeah, at this point, it's pretty much a wrap. So very, yeah. very thankful. Yeah. So just timing wise, like I was saying, when Rich and Brian called me, it was really as things were just about wrapped up mm. with my case. And so just seeing the timing of that, where I just felt like I was saying, all right, we're, we're closing that chapter and this is going to be part of a new chapter. Yeah. You know, we can go back to Paul's analogy, right? Paul in the midst of stuff, it got closed. He got a new name and then a new chapter, right? Like it was this very yes. defined new season of life. And I love that it's a weird, we don't do this anymore, change people's names, but I love the changing of names that happens in scripture. Cause it's like, it shapes, reshapes your identity into like where God's calling you. And I'm curious if you feel coming out of that season and into this new one, this shift in identity that's attached to that new understanding of the gospel and what that looks like as you look ahead. Cause you know, it's six months in at this point, it's still the beginning. Mm-hmm. So in terms of identity, I would say, I definitely feel like uh, a new creation. Hmm. You know, it's interesting how God uses really hard things to refine us, you know, and, and you could kind of look at that and go, man, why did God have to make it that way? Right. Yeah, he could have gone with any other process. Exactly. It's kind of a natural law, and and that's the way God created us and created the world. But, you know, that's that's the way it is. And, man, I, I look at the things that God did in me through that. And like we said, I, w- I wouldn't trade it for anything. And, and I think it's almost kind of flattering when you think about it, Dan. It sounds funny, but that the God of the universe would take time to allow or even orchestrate something really hard in your life to make you more like his son or mm-hmm. to help you become the best version of yourself. You know, it's, it's pretty amazing. And it's something I'm incredibly grateful for as hard as that was, man. And you know, this is suicide awareness month. I, I was reaching that point, man. I had yeah. suicidal thoughts. It was the depression was really heavy. Mm. really heavy and that regret man. and it's like like you're saying 
at the beginning, you brought up how there's, there's hope on the other side, right? Yeah. We can't lose sight of that and, and trusting the process. I mean, I was always kind of a dreamer, you know, I mean, every kid dreams of being like a professional baseball or football player or whatever. I had those dreams as a kid, but even as an adult, you know, went to Fuller, they had a really cool program. Yeah. And I, I took theology and film and this guy, I had dreams of being uh, maybe a screenwriter, getting into the film industry somehow, even as an adult, you know, and, and even when I was living in Michigan, the dreams of living in California, I would always just kind of, I, I would even see discontent through this. God just, he crushed me, you know? Yeah. I, I would say that's a pretty appropriate word. He crushes us and rids us of, of those things that need to be gone. And that spirit of discontentment, he, he literally washed it away. I, I had to reach a point where, man, I would wake up in the morning just simply thankful to be in my own bed. Mm. Thankful that we get to sit down as a family and have dinner together. Like those moments that you just took for granted all the time became so special. Yeah. You know, like invaluable. Watching my son play football, watching my daughter play a water polo match taking a walk with my wife, with our dog. These things took on a whole new level of meaning. I wasn't dreaming about anything. Yeah. I was so focused in the moment. That's what needed to happen, you know, in me. And, and we all have those things that need correcting, that need to be washed away. And that's part of what happened to me, man, is just, I just had this whole new sense of gratitude just for what was, mm -hmm. instead of dreaming about, you know, this or that or what could be. Uh, and it was, yeah. it was a wonderful thing. Mm, that's pretty cool. So thinking back on this experience, and it sounds like there was a ton that you learned and, and, and ways that you grew, but for somebody who's maybe in the season of depression or dealing with something that's totally out of their control that could really change the trajectory of their life, maybe regret, what advice do you have for them in it right now? Mm, I would say, you know, it's just very cliche, but trust the process. You know, one of the things that my attorney said was, Hey man, you won't be able to just fix this. Yeah. You know, it, this is not something you have control over. You can just fix it. and It's gone in a few months. Uh, I think in a lot of the hard things that we go through, that's our natural tendency. We want to fix it. We want it to go away, but trust that God has a purpose and that he's going to work out that purpose if we're willing to see this through, yeah. you know, lean into scripture, uh, let God speak through that. I mean, I remember one verse that really, I just, I leaned on through that entire season was Exodus 14, 14, the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Mm -hmm. And that aligned with what my attorney had said, Hey man, you're not going to be able to fix this. It was like, Hey, this is out of your hands. That's when the Israelites were, backed up against the Red Sea with yeah. nowhere to go, Egyptians pursuing and hey, the Lord will fight for you. You can only be still. I mean, how hard would it be to trust that in that situation? Well, we need to, we need to trust that. Yeah. Uh, in some of these situations. So uh, I, I would say that for sure. Uh, my son, even he trusted there's going to be a purpose on the other side as well. Right. Like, so, a lot of the things we go through, we can help others as they are struggling in similar situations in the future, right? Yeah. It's all the time. And in fact, my son is, uh, is at Northwestern in Chicago. He's playing football. He's a freshman. He's had a rough couple of months to start. It was extremely tough at the beginning. You know, he dealt with a lot of homesickness and things like that. And I just knew partially through what I've been through that this is perfectly normal. And yes, it's a struggle. Yes, he's probably going to want to quit. Yes, he doesn't see what's on the other side of this. And already, even in a couple months, uh, just yesterday, he, he had a lot of affirmation and confirmation of how well he's doing, even though he was really hard on himself, not feeling like he was performing well. Uh, so, I mean, that was a fairly rapid, you know, kind of recovery. Yeah. And, and he's still, he's still, you know, making progress, but trust that there is purpose even on the other side of it, right? Through it and on the other side. Yeah. Mm. So for the person who, who hears you say that they go, okay, yeah, I want to do that. I want to be able to trust that. 
how do I remind my, like, what is a practical way that I can, you mentioned prayer, but what are other ways that I can practically remind myself when it doesn't feel like that's true, uh, that it is? I would say, seek out people who have been in a similar situation. Hmm. Hear from them. Be encouraged by them. Yeah. Avoid isolation. Surround yourself with other people who are going to be able to be your support, your encouragement. Openly talking about it. Whatever that struggle is, is going to be huge, you know, and having that support network. So I would say that's, that's another thing, hugely important. Yeah, that's awesome. I like to finish the conversations by asking, what's a hard thing that you're in the middle of right now? Mm. The first thing that comes to mind is this past summer, we moved my son into Northwestern in Chicago. And then we moved my daughter, who spent her first year at community college out here living with us. We moved her into Baylor in Waco, Texas. So we went from uh, four kids down to two and it's been a transition, man. We're a tight knit family, very close to our kids. And it's been tough. You know, there's just kind of been that, I guess you could say depression, you know, initial depression of, of this transition time and, and family not being the same and kids being away and helping them deal with some of their initial struggles makes it even harder. Yeah. But I would say, man, just, after everything we've been through, trusting the process, knowing that there's great things on the other side of all this is definitely something that, that keeps us hopeful. You know, it's something that we can hang on to, knowing that God has great plans for them exactly where they are. And, uh, and there's going to be some awesome stuff at the end of all this. So mm-hmm. just, just not letting your emotions take over or, or drive any decisions or, you know, so, so yeah, that's, that's something that's been a little tough. Yeah. Yeah, no kidding. Mm. Well, Ben, first of all, thank you. I I wanted to just call out like the thing that you said about it's actually flattering to think that God would refine me. Uh, it's just like a really like that's just profound, I think, and good wisdom. But I also wanted to ask you here as we wrap up, you know, you're the executive director of Mayhem Mission. You're also a father of four and have these other roles and parts that you play for people that you know, maybe something you said really resonated with them, or they're curious about Mayhem Mission. Uh, Maybe they just want to know how to uh, have an intentional approach to fatherhood. Uh, Like, how can people be in touch with you, follow you, follow Mayhem Mission, uh, and and maybe learn a little bit more? For sure. So I'd say the best thing to do, uh, if you want to follow Mayhem Mission and what we're doing, we always keep our website updated. It's just mayhemmission.org. We also post a lot on Instagram. So that Mayhem Mission was not available. So we had to call it Mayhem Missions. So if you look for Mayhem Missions, you'll find it. And uh, please email me, n at mayhemmission.org. Yeah, you know, that's awesome. And I'll just test to be a testimony to you that you've been super gracious with your time and generous and approachable. And uh, I really respect you and the, the wisdom that you have and uh, admire you from a distance since we're, you know, not in the same state or anything, but grateful to know you and, and grateful to hear your story and that you're willing to share it with our audience and with me. And I'm, I'm confident that it'll be an encouragement for a lot of people. So thanks for, for spending some time, Ben. I appreciate it a lot. Absolutely. Thank you, Dan. I've, I've listened to some of the other podcasts. They're very encouraging. You're doing an awesome job. So keep up the great work and I appreciate everything you're doing too. So thank you. I'm honored, honored to be on the podcast. Thanks, Ben. I'm sure it'll be a blessing. Thanks for listening to the Do Hard Things podcast by Elite SRS. We hope you are encouraged today and have a newfound hope to persevere. Be sure to subscribe for more great episodes and conversations. And if you ever want to watch an episode, check out our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com slash Elite SRS. Have a blessed day.